Thank you, Farah. Thank you for that overly kind in introduction. If I was uber charming, I might have had more success with the chicks in San Francisco, <laughs> but there you go. Anyway, thank you all for coming. I think it's fantastic to see you all here you know, early on an autumnal morning. Uh, luckily, the rain is holding off till you leave. I'm going to talk about construction, but first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about design in the modern world. So this is a stadium in Melbourne. It's called Amy Park. It's also actually called the Rectangular Pitch Stadium because it is the first time that the Victorians, those in Victoria and Australia who are mad about sport, have decided to build a stadium around a rectangular pitch. Okay. They've actually recognised that soccer and rugby are sports that they might as well enjoy. Anyway, this is our response, if you like, to the Beijing Olympic Stadium, the Bird's Nest. The Bird's Nest, I think, is the most beautiful stadium in the world, in my opinion, anyway. But it's not actually very structurally efficient. In other words, the structure is there to make the architecture or to make the art, to make the sculpture. And our question, our challenge to ourselves was actually, can we come up with a form that is also a structure and be structurally efficient? So we came up with these ideas of these cantilever shell roofs. But having come up with a form as a general proposition, we went into it in more detail and built a parametric model whereby everything follows everything else. So the red lines on the left-hand side of the slide are the control lines, and as we adjust their geometry, the geometry of the rest of the roof follows. For each geometry we come up with, we can automatically size the whole structure and say, well, how much tonnage of steel is there in it? We can have a look at what does it look like as we change things. Do we prefer it? Do we not prefer it? And we also looked at the um, panelization of the structure. How much repetition did we get in the cladding? So basically, in the middle of it is a computer, an engine, if you will. You adjust it, you get something new, you check it in three different dimensions, and you say, have I got better or worse? And if you got better, you try again. If you got worse, you try again, but in a different direction. You could have harnessed it to um, some kind of genetic algorithm and automated the process. But I actually am beginning to have a strong view that it's better to do it by hand. That if you don't engage with the process, you don't actually understand so much of what's going on. And you learn from the engagement, and you might decide to change the form altogether. If you automate it, the problem is, although it compresses the time frame, the learning is less, and you may end up in a place where you could have been somewhere else altogether, if you see what I mean. Another advantage, of course, of doing all this in the cyber world is you end up knowing roughly what something's going to look like. So this is a, a computer graphic, simple rendering of the uh, building before we built it, and this is the building once it was completed. So you can see we can get a fairly accurate view as to what we're going to get. Uh, this is just me showing off, if you like, showing it on the river down in Melbourne, a you know, fantastic city. You can see the city in the background. It's the only city in the world, I think, where they put all the sporting precincts. So you've got the MCG, the Rod Laver Arena, now Amy Park Stadium, all visible from the city. So you can see what's going on. You can interact with your sporting precinct and decide, you know, after work, will I wander down there or not? And, of course, it lights up at night. It's a major thing with sport, is to herald the actual action, to speak to the outside, not just to the inside of a stadium. Second project I'm going to talk about design of is this um, tower in the middle here, which is 111 Eagle Street in Brisbane. It was a very awkward site because it sat right between the two rather beautiful um, Harry Seidler modernist towers, left and right of that, which were already constructed. And our site is sitting right here in the middle. So... This is one of Harry's towers. This is the other of Harry's towers. The whole of the podium is already constructed and operating. And the main entrance uh, for the goods loading dock here is right through the middle of the site we're trying to put a building on. Okay? So instead of trying to move the goods loading dock and rebuild the podium, we said, well, how can we adapt our building to suit the situation? So our core is off-center for our building. And at a 40-storey building, the core is no longer competent to withstand wind loads on its own. So we had to have a perimeter frame of some kind in the structure. And the other thing is we put the perimeter columns wherever we could put them, wherever they would thread through the basement, which turned out with a sort of slightly irregular form of columns. Right. So we decided to make sort of something of a virtue of the difficulties and said, can we grow a perimeter frame that works for the wind loads and fits those columns. And we said, well, if they start off random, let's keep them random the whole way up the building. So we developed a little computer script that simply generated a lift of columns for a story using random numbers. It said, if we, we know where we're starting from, because that's where the last columns have stopped. We'll generate a set of columns. 
But then we'll check them for structural efficiency. <coughs> Does this random pattern lean equally left and right? Does it lean equally front to back? Does it have an equal amount of torsion being generated? Does it have an average lean of five degrees, which is roughly what it takes to carry the wind shear without anything going into tension? Does it, have, um, does it minimize the span of the edge beam on the floor above? And we just put a lower limit on it. Is it eight meters or, or less? If, if all those answers are no, you simply throw that set of columns away and generate another one. Yeah? And after about a thousand efforts, you, know, you get a set that works. So you then move to the story above. After about a million goes, you get to the top, and you've got a whole building. So you put that building on the shelf, you go back to the bottom, and you start again. And when you've got 20 or so buildings, you take them off the shelf, and you say, which one do I like? The answer, of course, nine times out of ten, is none of them. Right? In which case, you change the algorithm. You rewrite the code and try something slightly different. So you can see this is actually the final building, where we deliberately made the building a little bit more random at the top than at the bottom, because we thought that looked nicer. And also because you can, because there's less load up there. There's less wind load, there's less gravity load. So you can afford to have the columns a little bit more free form. But at the bottom, where they're doing work, real work, you keep them relatively vertical. So that was just a twist. This picture I still like. Um, it's now six years later, I guess. But on the left is the structural engineer's drawing or model. And on the right is the architect's drawing or model. And for the first time in my career, they're the same because we actually, having generated the data in a machine, you know, we were working off the same data. <laughs> it's actually the same geometry. And of course, you know, whether this is post-rationalised or real, I won't quite try and discern, but um, it, the whole building emulates this wonderful fig tree that's actually sitting in a road outside the front door. So you've got this real connection you know, to reality on the outside. And it lights up at night. Of course, the purpose of all of this, if you like, one of the purposes is to get all this information into the virtual world, into a digital world, so we can accurately define it. Okay, so this is now about BIM. <coughs> this is a sludge treatment works in Hong Kong. I suspect this is the most beautiful sludge treatment works in the world. But the more importantly, every component of it is accurately modelled in the virtual world during the design process. And I mean component as in the plant, the process, the infrastructure, as well as the structure of the building services and everything else. This, of course, can be used for crash detection, you know, everybody's favourite, although in a way that's just the superficial surface of what you can do in, in the BIM world. You can also skin the building, take, it, take off the volumes, for example, off this building, and then use it for your CFD smoke analysis. Or anything else, and everything else that we do during design. Extending the principle here, we're looking at um, acoustic noise contours around a proposed motorway in Wales. So all these things can be deduced, conveyed, and looked at. Here, going one step further with sand, we can emulate um, the room acoustics of anything that we're designing, as in the top image. And then the bottom diagram shows how you can then reproduce that using a set of surround speakers. In this case, 12 speakers in the Arab Sound Lab, one of which is just through that door over there. If any of you have not been there, I thoroughly recommend it. It's, a, it's an interesting experience to sit in a room and be placed in any seat you want in any concert hall in the world and hear what it sounds like, even the ones that haven't been built. Sound is, it's funny, I'd, I wouldn't have predicted it, but because of course it's intangible, but it is subjective and, and produces an emotional reaction, to be able to hear things before they get built is phenomenally beneficial. Then, of course, before we build something, we can work out how to build it. The same model can be used in, in um, construction logistics. So this is the Barangaroo site in Sydney, currently under construction with Lend-Lease. Uh, Rogers are the, the architects, were the engineers. And all of this modelling can be put to good use by adding in the cranes, the site logistics, and the sequencing of the building. Or here at the Olympic Park, in getting planning permission to the orbit, and I won't comment on whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, we could produce a computer model of the whole site. So this is the computer model you can see here. The beginning of the movie was reality. This is um, an artificial rendering of reality, if you like. This is back to um, part reality, part rendering. But we can get all this established before we make decisions and help inform our decision making. One step further, perhaps, and this is something we developed some time ago, and it's still 
probably not used as well as it could be, but this is um, a product called Mass Motion. This is a, a bit of software that we developed from the film industry. It was originally um, put together for Lord of the Rings, where they thought all the orcs in the army should behave differently. They shouldn't all be the same as they were in Star Wars, for example. And so each one of these agents, or people in this case, are independent. They all have their own little bit of computer programming that tells them what to do, and they respond to their environment. So when they meet other people, they go around them. When they meet an object, you know, they duck it. If they want to go shopping, they find the retail center. Yeah. And we can program you know, real-life situations like this um, escape, for example, and entry and egress from railway stations, um, tune it against what we know happens in real disaster scenarios, and now get a very good correlation. I don't know where this should be taken next, but I'm sure there are tons of opportunities as to what you can do with that. So in summary, I guess, what I'm trying to say is in the design world, we can, we don't always do, but we can simulate almost everything before we get to site. We can define everything to the nearest millimeter. We can decide on the performance of everything. We can say where the supplier is. We can organize the supply chain. We can do whatever we want. Yet, we still build like this. Okay. Now, when I started at Arup, as Farah points out, over 30 years ago, we built like this for a good reason, apart from the fact you could. It was because actually the designers did not define everything. They gave you a set of plans and elevations and drawings that vaguely represented what they wanted. They probably weren't coordinated, and the elevation sections and plans probably didn't even fit together. And so, but if you used concrete and timber and made things on site, it didn't matter so much because you fitted it together as you went along. One of the reasons I think builders love concrete and have only sort of reluctantly entered the age of steel is because you can fix it as you go. You can knock it down, you can form it again. You can make the things fit together. But we don't have to do that anymore. So the question arises is what should we be doing? And I'm just going to give you some examples in the second half of this talk. Here we see um, some housing designed by uh, Rogers again, uh, built or constructed by Wood Newton for Wimpy. And here what you've got are these panels are coming to site and being erected very quickly. What's, what's missing from this movie, though, is that the panels were all made by computer-controlled machinery in a, in a factory specially made to make these panels. Relatively low, modest investment, one of the advantages of timber is you can, you know, the machinery is cheap. But the overall consequence of this is that you can decide what house you want. In other words, it can be a bespoke design using this principle eight weeks before you move into the completed home. It is a phenomenal change, potentially, from what we've got at the moment. You only make the thing when you know what it is you want and when you know somebody wants it. This is a um, unitised building in Melbourne. Um, these are people from where well, I've spent the last 20 years in Australia. Some of you may know, some of you may not. These guys are building apartments. Right? And this is an architect who became frustrated as an architect because he didn't get enough commission, so he became a developer. And then he got frustrated as a developer that things cost too much and took too long to build and became a builder. And he made a factory in which he constructs apartments. It's quite a clever system, I think. The front of the apartment, the typically they're built in, in steel boxes. Those aren't shipping containers. They look like shipping containers. They're bespoke for every project. The front end is glazed. The interior is fully fitted out. All the umbilical cords and the plumbing hang out the back. And then on site, you build the vertical circulation and, and join it all together. You end up with a much higher quality product and potentially at a cheaper cost. He has come across a, a, a major problem, of course which is that while he can build apartments for about $2,000 a square metre and the industry rates about $3,000 a square metre, his factory makes precisely two apartments a day. If he cannot supply two apartments a day, he loses money. So actually he has to supply them at $3,000 a square metre because to make up for the idle time, if you like, between times. So it is an issue, I think, as we enter the era of manufacturing for construction, is that what's the equivalent of parking the cars you know, down on the docks waiting for them to be shipped off to the dealers. You know, what do we do with bits of buildings in that context? There is another way of going about it. It's not just necessarily 
going to a factory, making parts, bringing them to site and assembling them. But instead, you can start making things directly from the computer pattern. So in this case, we're looking at large CNC machinings of pieces of aluminium, which make up this structure. Or you can use rapid prototyping and make whole parts. And you might think, well, you know, that's not really the scale that works for a building. But in Italy, again, about five years ago, faced with the issue of trying to build this futuristic house, for example, I think actually the machine came first, but never mind, they developed this, a rapid prototyping machine that can deal with an 8 meter by 8 meter by 8 meter um, piece of structure. It uses sand and an ammonium sort of agent, binding agent, that pulls it together to make approximately concrete. So do we actually go and make things in the factory and bring them to the site and assemble them? Or do we bring the machines to the site and start making things in situ? Or what about automating the site itself? What else can we do? This is a mine in West Australia, in the Kimberleys, uh, Rio Tinto. It's a large open cast mine. And one of the issues they had is that their um, rather large trucks you know, occasionally didn't do what people wanted them to do. And so they decided, really from a safety perspective, to what would happen if they made all the trucks driverless. Okay. So this whole mine, there is not a single truck driver anymore. The mines are, are guided by both <laughs> local lasers and radars and remote control, and a combination thereof. And it works itself around the truck. And, and the consequence has been really quite profound. Um, for a start, the trucks never have hangovers. They never take sickies. They get, they're about 25% more productive than when they had drivers. But more interestingly is this slide, which is hard to understand, I know, so bear with me a moment. But because the computer that controls the trucks also has full information as to where the ore bodies are in the mine, it can also work out where the most effective place to do the next drill and blast operation and where the ore should be mined from. You know, and therefore it can exploit the mine in the most efficient way possible much more efficiently than when it was all being done by hand. And I think what's more surprising is it's all controlled by this bloke, who is 1,000 kilometres away in Perth. Okay. So what does that mean for us? We all know about these robot arms. We know that these exist in factories, and you can see that they can do you know, almost anything you wish. What you may not be familiar with, though, is this, and it's a slightly odd thing, so bear with me for a moment. These are mechanised um, objects to train snipers. Okay. They're segway bottoms with, with targets on top. And I'm afraid I haven't got a better video than this. This is a, a shot at a, a talk by Hugh Durant White, who designed these, the robot, the, the <coughs> technology behind them at least. The point about them is they learn, they cooperate, and they learn to hide from whoever it is who's learning to shoot them. They go in and out of buildings, they hide behind walls, they act as decoys one for another, and they actually behave much like you and I. And I'm told that there is a worldwide challenge amongst the robotics experts in university as to who can f develop the first football team that will beat a human one. And it's not far-fetched, apparently. This is, you know, not very far away. So my, my question is, what happens if you put the robot arm on the Segway bottom and tell it to wire up a building? It's don't, I actually do not think it is incredible at all. But I think we have a problem, a fundamental systemic problem in our industry. If you go back to the idea of doing it all with concrete and timber, it didn't matter in a way who you employed to build the building. So you could separate design and construction. And we're still stuck in this rut that we take a full design to tender and we'll get the best price. But by doing so, you have to reduce the building to its lowest common denominator and components so that everybody can build it. Right. What would happen if we broke free from that paradigm? And instead of doing that, we actually change from design and build that has a nasty reputation in this country to design with build. Working together, we can design things that work within a contractor's capabilities, whoever it is who's chosen to build that building. So this reminds me of what I was told about IKEA. In IKEA, when they want a new piece of furniture, 
And the first thing they do is decide which factory is going to make it. And the brief to the designer is design a piece of furniture within the capabilities of that factory. Okay. Now imagine how much we could move the construction industry forward if we took that approach to design and building. Thank you. So I apologise if I've seduced you into a, um, a talk which I said was going to be talking about craft, because obviously it wasn't. But anyway, <laughs> any questions? Tristan, your work points towards design in, in its purest sense. So an F1 car is a piece of design. Your buildings are a piece of design. Mr Eiffel, Mr Paxton were pieces of design. Yeah. Why are we not talking openly about design rather than all these components. You avoided the team when you described your design build. Uh, shouldn't we all be coming together to eliminate the waste, to use BIM, to save risk, which no one wants to take anymore? Yes, in answer. But the big risk that manifests itself is for the, the, the client, the proponent, is they don't have to choose a team and trust that team you know, to come together and be the designers from beginning to end. I, I absolutely agree with you, Stuart. I just think it's a bit of a big step from where we are today, so I, 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 I cut it into pieces for the sake of the argument. But yes, of course that's where we should be. Yeah. Um, my question is really about sort of competitiveness. What, what, what I find really exciting at the moment is that we've got very small offices uh, or consultancies eating very big because of this technology yes. breakthrough. And if you transfer that scale not just to London or the UK, you know, um, our competitors around the world, in the design world, it's, it's, just, it's talking about, I think it's a very exciting time. So, you know, Arab is a very large scale company, and then you've got very small consultancies. I, I wondered if you have any reflection on that notion of competitiveness. Well, okay, the notion of competitiveness, I think, you know, my reflection is it, it sort of comes in two different dimensions simultaneously. And one, one seems beneficial, one perhaps argue, arguably isn't. And the beneficial one is that the access to the technology is available to everybody. You, know, you can go and buy the piece of software you know, and be using Revit from your kitchen, if you like, or wherever you are as a, as a single uh, sole trader. At the other end, of course, some of what I'm talking about on the construction end requires heavy investment, capital investment which hasn't traditionally been part of the construction industry. Yeah. And therefore, you know, you, you, if you look at the manufacturing industries, you say, you know, where are the Boeings of construction? Where's, you know, where's the Ford Motor Company? And is that what we need to make progress? So I can see it as being a, you know, <laughs> a bit of a balancing act. And I, I don't wish to predict which of those will actually occur, you know, if you like. But I think that technology tends towards reducing the necessary scale and reducing the amount of investment required. I had a chance to ask Ken Livingston about the planning issues when he was uh, up against uh, Bojo, and um, it was uh, his answer was that actually there's a lack of skills being brought into the industry. It's education. Yeah. It was actually a very straightforward answer. Who wants to be a planner at the moment? Yeah, yeah, there's no money in it, and it's, a lot of the skill base has been lost. Well, that, that does bring me to another topic, which I do you know, feel quite strongly about. Is is this? Turning the whole generations upside down. You know. Again, when I started, I expected to learn from people more senior in the organisation and typically you know, more elderly, older people. They knew what they were doing. But we're gradually moving to a place where that's not the case. We're gradually moving to a place where graduates know more than their leaders. Yeah? That's a very tricky thing to deal with. You know, I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm calling it the, the, the digital gap, or divide. Yeah? And we're finding, even in Arab, where we know that BIM is beneficial, we're not adopting it as fast as we should. And I think the key reason is project leaders not wishing to take a risk and doing something with a medium they're not familiar with and actually don't understand. Yeah? And I suspect you know, if that's happening inside our organisation, I assume it's happening throughout the industry. And it must be a problem. Because you then get the next problem, which is the knowledge, which definitely does reside with the older people, doesn't get transferred. 
And so you get things designed that shouldn't be designed, if I can summarise it like that. And I would have thought the same would apply in planning, potentially. The planning system does resist them, but it takes a very long time. So floor-to-floor -floor heights gradually change with the technology. Residential needs gradually change with the consumer needs. But every designer wants a residential building at 2.8, 2.93, 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, and they want a a window, window module which is different, and it's thought to be design. They don't want to give it up. Yes. That's another actual, um, that's another debate, I think, which hasn't, to my mind, isn't, um, isn't resolved, is do you design um, incredibly tightly to your brief and minimise your use of resources, material, and height, and space, and everything else, and provide precisely what is required for that design, or you do you design um, loosely for future adaptability, but you have no clue as to what that might be, and you might have got the wrong looseness, if you like, when you get to it. You know, every time I've been involved with a project that's in phases, um, and you carefully plan phase two, when phase two comes along, we do something totally different. <laughs> Thank you all very much. He was naughty to not talk about craftsmanship enough, but in a way he was talking about craftsmanship um, in an a obtuse Tristram way. Um, but it, it's lovely to have a chance, when you work with someone and you spend lots of time in meetings with them, um, it's different than actually letting, letting them talk without it always having you mediating and having a response immediately. So for me it was fantastic to have someone I've been working with for some time now to actually get to know them more somehow. Um, and uh, he's, he's a brilliant person and a brilliant presenter. And uh, the, I, I've, I find his leadership inspires me in what we're doing in the studio. I was actually going back to uh, what the, the title of the talk is about craft. And, uh, you know, it, it, basically what Tristan was talking about wasn't much about craft in the sense of using human hands is what pictures of woodworking stone carving etc even sort of making concrete stuff and what if that was left completely to machines or digitization how would people relate to buildings i mean sometimes you you go into a building you can put your you, can, you touch it you feel the stone and if you got to the point where everything you touched couldn't be made by hand anymore it actually went beyond replace the hand and make it with stone, but it actually couldn't be fixed. How do people relate it? And psychologically, it might start becoming a different relationship with people. I was just talking to Tristram about, you know, what is it that people fall in love with buildings? Is that how they relate to it? Psychologically, I think part of it might be where there's a sense that there was actually a human craft intervention by hands, and if they knew none of it came from actual hand intervention, whether that's would actually, how, to what degree would it make it look different and how people feel different about it. The analogy would be with, uh, you know, nowadays it becomes a throwaway society in terms of when something breaks of an old radio, people used to go back and get it fixed. Now, it stops, throw it away and start again. Will buildings become the same where, oh, I can't open the door anymore, let's chuck the whole building away and start again. So. That's the sort of thing I was thinking about. <laughs>